Astronomy Cast, episode 291 for Monday, January 28th, 2013. Shockwaves. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? doing great. So this is one of those episodes t pulled out of time and space and it's all wibbly wobbly timey wimey uh, <laughs> in that we're recording this about three weeks after the date that we're posting it and so today's topic which is shockwaves is kind of apropos because when we're recording this it's actually in February and the uh, meteor just hit Russia and so we thought we, we already had shockwaves on our list of topics but we thought it would be cool to to cover the topic so when we're talking about things that it sounds like we're predicting the future we're, we're actually not. not no we're we are just taking a topic that was very relevant and throwing it into the uh, into the recent stream of, of episodes so yeah uh, and then the other thing is that I guess if uh, people uh, don't uh, catch us in time. We're going to be at South by Southwest from March uh, 8th, well, March 7th to March 11th, but specifically the 8th, 9th, and 10th. And we're going to be uh, joining NASA and Microsoft and a bunch of other people to to hopefully run some live star, star parties. There's going to be amateur astronomers out with telescopes. We're going to be haunting that area. There's going to be a live <laughs> a model of the uh, of the James Webb Space Telescope and we're going to try and run some actual live events right from South by Southwest. So it's going to be We promise really great... no undead astronomers. No undead astronomers. astronomers yeah. haunting the site. Yeah. Well, I just imagine that, you know, as we just roam around looking at telescopes, showing people the night sky, doing live events. We've got lots of good stuff planned. So yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you're going to be at South by Southwest, by all means, look us up. Uh, just look for the gigantic model of the James Webb Space Telescope, and we'll be uh, we'll be nearby. We we will be down near Zilker Park. So if you know Austin, that's that's the area we're going to be in down along the river. I don't know Austin very well. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> um, okay, great. Were there any more announcements? Not that I can no. think of. Okay, all right. So, uh, as we all know, a meteor crashed into the atmosphere above Russia, teaching the world the importance of shock waves, how they're caused, how they propagate through the atmosphere. Now, today we'll discuss the topic in general and find many examples where shock waves can be created here on Earth and out in space. And so, as we mentioned, uh, you know, as we're recording this episode, we're about four days after the meteor struck in, in Russia, uh, detonating in the high atmosphere and causing a massive shock wave that blew out the windows of the city and causing a lot of damage and a lot of injuries. Yeah. So, so can we kind of sort of, I'd like to sort of go back and sort of relive that day and sort of talk about what actually happened with the, now we have a lot more details, we know the right. size, what happened. So can you sort of tell people what happened in that event? Well, it, in in as brief as possible, a uh, what was it thousand ton asteroid meteoroid seven thousand ton seven thousand okay yeah. a seven thousand ton meteoroid uh, decided to intersect Earth's orbit and it did this such that it came crashing through the Earth's atmosphere over eastern Siberia streaking through the sky and then exploding, um, crumbling, choose your verb of choice. Um, right before it got to the Ural Mountains, it did this at an altitude of about 32,000 feet. And this process, you have very fast moving objects slamming through the atmosphere at greater than the speed of sound, created a shock wave propagating through the atmosphere, a sonic boom, if you will. And this sonic boom uh, is estimated to have had uh, a pressure that caused the air to move at roughly 500 miles per hour, which that was the gust that um, made very loud noises and blew out windows, window frames, and a lot of other stuff. The actual damage that's attributed to the meteoroid itself, which became a meteorite as it hit the planet, um, those shards appear to have gone into a lake, that's confirmed, and there is a factory that lost a chunk of wall for reasons that are still being sorted because if there's chunks of meteorite inside that 
uh, factory they're going to have to be found in the midst of, well, it was a zinc factory and it was made out of brick, so it's just a mess. Right. And I think, uh, from what I hear, like something like a third of the, of the windows in the city were blown out. It's, it's like a billion ruples worth of damage. And, and you can imagine, I mean, I, I was thinking about the scenario, right? Imagine this. You, you're standing, you know, you're in your house, you're eating your breakfast, having your coffee. It's early in the morning. Yeah. You, and then you see this really bright flash that, that illuminates your entire room and house. And so you walk over to the window this was 9.20 in the morning. Yeah, so it was, you know, it was coffee time, breakfast time, whatever. And so you look up and you see this, you see the after effect of the impact. You see this contrail in the sky. You're like, that's really weird. What is that? And you find your camera and you take a picture. And then two and a half minutes later, everyone's standing right in front of their windows looking up. Bam! The shockwave hits and just shatters the glass on their windows. And so you just imagine it was the perfect situation for people to stand right in front of their windows and then two and a half minutes later get struck yeah. by these, so these shattered glass. 1,200 people are estimated to have sought medical attention in, in oh. the three different cities that were affected by this and the time delay between when the object was seen streaking through the sky. So that's traveling at the speed of light. Um, and when the sound wave, the sonic boom hit people and blew out their windows uh, range from right about a minute to two minutes, 20 seconds. So it wasn't good. No, no. So um, let's go back then and take, and take another look at, at really what were the physics of, of this situation. What, what is the shockwave and, and what really happened? Well, in this case, it, it's literally a matter of you have an object traveling through the medium, air, at greater than the speed of sound. And the speed of sound is the rate at which a compression wave can move through an elastic medium. So this would be air, this would be dirt, this would be any of a number of different things that are capable of compression and decompression. So as that sound wave, that pressure wave, moves through the medium, it has a certain speed. Now, if something's trying to plow through that medium, and the sound of it plowing through the medium can't get away from it as fast as it's going through the medium. This creates a discontinuity. So on one side of the medium you have a very different pressure than on the other side of the medium that's caused in this case by the object moving through the medium. That's a lot of uses of the word medium. Right. But, but, but the, just so I understand though, like when I'm talking the the pressure waves are coming out of my my mouth yes. at the speed of sound yes. and and it's happy you know the air it, is happy yes. to absorb these these pressure waves and move them through this medium it's when you've got something that's that's not playing by the rules yes and and so this is the case of you can imagine you're running along and you're shouting to your friend and the waves are exiting your mouth and traveling through the medium propagating in front of you um, but they're going faster than you are. Now, what happens at that moment that you're then traveling at the speed of sound or faster than the speed of sound? Uh, people often ask this with the speed of light, except there you're lucky because you can't actually travel faster than the speed of light because time stops. Right. Well, with sound, you end up instead with these sonic booms, these uh, discontinuities in the medium where the sound is is the shock wave rather is creating this pressure front, this discontinuity in the medium where on one side of the medium it's one pressure, on the other side of the medium it's another pressure. And that discontinuity moving out, it carries a lot of energy with it. But what speed does this, this pressure wave move through the medium? That depends on, uh, well that depends on what speed the object generating it is traveling at. All of these things get tied together. And in the case of the Russian meteorite, some of the uh, math that I've seen works out at close to 500 miles per hour. Right, but even though, I mean, when the meteorite struck the, uh, the atmosphere, it was moving at, you know, whatever, 18,000 miles an hour. It was moving yes. fast. And so definitely the sound was not moving that fast. It had no. to slow right down. Well, and, and it's not only that, but as the, pro the wave propagates, it loses energy. And part of that energy is, is the rate at which it's moving at. So it starts out moving much faster, and then it slows down as it moves out, as that energy has to fill a larger and larger volume, as it has a larger and larger surface area that makes up the discontinuity. 
And so do you get a situation where the the energy is dissipated to the point that the wave slows down to the the, the compression yes. speed of the yes. of the medium? And 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 this is actually something that we we all know has to be happening because if you think about supersonic airplanes if if the sonic boom from those supersonic airplanes didn't eventually stop we just have supersonic waves propagating around and around the planet uh, they do eventually taper off but um, it does take distance for that energy to get dissipated into the air right and so you've brought up uh, the I guess the most the other common form of shockwaves that a lot of people are quite familiar with and this is a, a supersonic aircraft but yeah. I guess in this situation it's not like you've got this meteor streaking down at 17,000 miles an hour and then it hits the atmosphere and slows down you've got kind of the opposite right which is that it's starting at a slower speed within the the, the speed of I guess the compression within the medium and then it crosses this line so what's going on there uh, you mean with the airplanes? Yeah, with with supersonic aircraft. So, um, yeah, you lost me for a moment. Sorry. Uh, so, with supersonic airplanes, you do. Yeah, it's just an airplane. It's it's doing what airplanes do. It's they speed up, they speed up, and with the supersonic ones, eventually they do cross the speed of sound. And when this happens, uh, suddenly the the pressure front created by them moving through the atmosphere stops making the normal happy airplane noise that we all hear on a regular basis, which I guess isn't happy when you're trying to enjoy the sound of the birds. Uh, but it goes from that to this pressure front that that is the disconnect between inside of it, things are moving faster, outside of it, things are moving slower, and when that discontinuity discontinuity hits you, hits your windows, uh, it can often get mistaken for a small earthquake because you just have this bam of everything shaking and that's the pressure front hitting you. Now what what happens while you're inside the airplane? Do you experience any of this shockwave? No, all it, it does, um, it makes it harder and harder to move as this is occurring so you actually do end up with um, it gets more difficult to travel the faster you go but superseding the speed of sound it becomes substantially more difficult to keep accelerating so that that's one thing you do have to take into account and depending on the shape of your craft it this can happen in a number of different ways there, there's two different types of shock waves that we have to deal with there's uh, the normal bow shock and then there's also an oblique shock and the oblique is the case of you have a round object meteoroid uh, moving through a medium and it ends up creating this curved pressure front that is disconnected from the object that's creating it. So you can imagine the round object moving through the medium and there's this area that it's essentially snow plowed in front of it, rather a volume in front of it that it's snow plowed and as it's pushing that out it creates this oblique shock wave in front of it. A um, airplane that is uh, um, shark no sharp nosed rather I can't speak um, I just realized I got those words backwards I'm sorry Preston you're going to have to delete that I just got bow shock and oblique backwards um, so we have two different types of, of shock waves moving through the medium one is created when you have a rounded object like a meteorite moving through the object and this is uh, your standard bow shock so as you have this big round object plowing through the medium it, it gets this volume of material built up in front of it that creates a rounded um, shock wave where you have that discontinuity between the pressure front in front of the object that's moving and then the normal speed of sound, normal pressure outside of that shock wave. The, the other type of shock that we get is an oblique shock. And this comes from having a sharp sharp nosed aircraft from the wedge shape of airplane wings and in this case you have the shock wave is connected to the object that's moving through so you have that sharp edge that the shock wave propagates away from whereas in the case of a bow shock there's that disconnect between the object creating the shock wave and where the shock wave occurs uh, basically one's pointy and the other's round and they have slightly different physics but in either case they make a loud boom now, will you ever get like multiple shockwaves coming off of an object? Like, is 
or is it always just like the one for the whole, like whatever's the leading edge of the of the object? You you can get various surfaces interacting with the air in different ways that cause different shapes to have for the the. You can end up with different shapes to the shock wave coming off, but one object will generally create one sonic boom coming off of it. You don't get a different sonic boom for the tail and for the nose of an aircraft. Now, we've been talking about, about shockwaves in air, but that's just a, a compressible medium, as you said. So where are some other places that we might see shockwaves, and what kinds of, of events would it take to, to make them happen? Well, it, in astronomy, we see these all the time. They come from supernovae. They come from stellar winds interacting with the interstellar medium. Uh, they, they come anytime you have something that's flaring or booming, even the ends of jets from, ex, from extragalactic objects, galaxies, active galactic nuclei. Uh, these jets, they can create within the intergalactic medium uh, shock waves as they compress that medium and there ends up being inside uh, the compression wave, a high pressure front, and outside of it, the normal pressures that the universe exists under. So could, give me a, like a specific example. Like, let's take a look at like a supernova explosion. How is that going to be interacting with its environment? Well, if you look at the Crab Nebula, to give a very specific example, you see all of these scalloped edges, all of these uh, tight knots within the medium. And in all of those different places, what you have is the energy of the outer atmosphere of the former star that was at the core of the supernova. As that light, as that material flies outward, it presses on the medium, compresses it. Uh, you can think of this as if you scatter flour across your desk and gently blow on the flour, it will end up streaming outwards. Now, if you go and you get some sort of a squeezy thing that will allow you to put out jets of uh, air, you can use that on the flour to end up creating shock waves through the flour. Um, the exact same principle applies with much more complicated math and much right. more beautiful structures when you look at supernovae. But here on Earth, when, when we have this shockwave, we hear it, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming we don't hear a shockwave in, in a supernova explosion. What well, do we see as so, the, where that shockwave is happening? And, and it, the reason we don't hear it is because the material is so diffuse that uh, even if we were to expose our ear eardrums to the horrors of interstellar space, um, there's just not enough material to vibrate our eardrums. Uh, in this case, what we see is those shocks are build, building up just walls of material that are getting scooped and pushed. Now, with, within our own solar system, we have this to a much smaller degree where our sun pushes out and clears out most of the material inside of our solar system through stellar winds. And it pushes against the interstellar medium. And there's, there's actually a point between where the interstellar winds push out and then a disconnect where the winds basically lose their ability to push things, where you have that pressure discontinuity. And on the other side, you just have normal interstellar space. And I guess whenever these gases, whenever these particles get mashed together, we get an increase in temperature and then a radiation that corresponds to that increase in temperature. And by radiation, that's just the light that's being given off. Yeah. And it, it all depends on, on what pressures are involved. Uh, so with, with the supernovae examples, you get uh, gases as they get compressed, get heated to temperatures that correspond to uh, oxygen molecules giving off light, to um, a variety of other molecules giving off light. But we don't have that point between where the solar wind and the interstellar media interact. We don't see that as a wall of light surrounding our solar system. Right, right. That's cool. So, so we've got you know the the solar wind coming from the sun. We've got these supernova explosions, and I think the, the other one that you mentioned, which is really fascinating, is these jets that come out of these supermassive black holes. So obviously, it's not coming out of the supermassive black hole itself. It's being generated by the the accretion, accretion desk. Accretion desk, yeah. Right, but still, you've got these these hundreds of thousands of light year long jets that are that are coming out. How are those interacting and creating a shockwave? 
So one of the prettiest examples of this is M87. So if you just Google M87, it'll bring up beautiful images that are usually a combination of the Hubble Space Telescope and various radio and X-ray images. And what you see is this long, narrow jet of material that then at the end appears to fountain out that uh, has basically just like a fountain at the top will stream out as gravity pulls the water back. Well in this case the the jet of material it's not getting pulled back to earth by gravity it's getting pushed back by the pressure of intergalactic space. So you have this jet firing out hitting the intergalactic media and then creating that shock wave, that discontinuity and pressures between inside and outside of the shock wave and uh, the shock wave curves out as the energy propagates through space. And one of the theories, I think, right, is that these these jets, as they're creating this, these piles up of gas, especially if they happen to, you know, interact with other galaxies, is you might get these to be places of star formation, right? That um, we don't really look for that as much, uh, but within our own galaxy, the shock waves from supernovae, we think could be possible for compressing star forming regions. Right. So it's inside of galaxies where we typically get star formation. There, there's a few examples. Uh, they're finding that when you look at light echoes from quasars hitting large pileups of gas in the intergalactic space, those, those light echoes contain enough energy to compress the gas enough to trigger some amounts of star formation. But the, the real intriguing usage is how is it that the energy from supernovae compresses, well, new star forming regions themselves inside of galaxies. And then I know we as well we get situations where you have events like on the surface of the sun where you can see these shock waves propagating through the you know around the atmosphere of the sun. Those are those are typically different forms of waves so we see uh, convection cells moving through the sun but those those are all traveling at the speed of sound or less usually a whole lot less than the speed of sound. Um, and then we see beautiful fountaining material that is a classic fountain. You can get shock waves within stars, though, um, but those are pretty special events. Right. If you smashed a planet into one, for example, you might get something happening. It depends on the infall rate of the planet. That's right, the cool right, part. <laughs> you right. can drop a planet in nice and slow and gentle, and it will cause effects, just not supersonic effects. <laughs> Now, so earlier on, you mentioned something which I thought was quite neat, which was, you know, any compressible medium, and you said, you even said, like, dirt. Yes, yes. So, so how, how, do, how can you have a shockwave moving through dirt? Well, I mean, if you think about it, you can compact dirt, and, and this is how certain types of earth, earthquakes travel through um, our Earth's crust. There, there's different types of waves, S waves, P waves, that's an entirely different show. Uh, but when the compression waves travel through the dirt, it's actually this energy front that essentially uh, acts like a, a, the way a wave can move through a slinky. If you take a slinky and you go like this, you can see the compression. If, if you move it left to right as it's horizontally stretched between your hands, you, you can see the compression move back and forth in the slinky. Dirt will do the exact same thing. Now, the speed of sound, however, is, is directly related to the density of the material, and the higher the density, the slower the speed, and it's also related to the stiffness of the material, and the stiff, stiffer the material, the slower the speed. This is why when you inhale helium gas, your voice becomes much more highly pitched. It, it's because the helium gas is a low density, uh, so, so the waves can travel faster, and you end up with that Mickey Mouse voice. I've never thought about the speed of sound in dirt, but yeah, there must be a speed of sound in dirt. A, every compressible medium has a speed of sound. Magma has a speed of sound. Uh, it's, it's just one of those kind of awesome things of if you can squish it, it has a speed of sound. Now, there is a medium that we're very familiar with that we actually can't squish that is not a compressible liquid, and that's water. Yeah, so, so water is, is mildly compressible. This is why you do still end up with sound moving through water. But it, it's not the most compressible of mediums. It, it's not like you can take a container of it and uh, squish it as readily as you can squish many other things out there. Um, so it's, it's not the most effective for propagating shock waves. And this is why if you fall from a great height and hit water, it's the same as hitting concrete because the, the water is just not going to compress under you. 
Right. So you, you have to break that surface tension, push the water molecules away. Um, but in general, a lot of the shocks that we're familiar with uh, end up creating things like tsunamis, which are a continuous wave front. So if you have a massive deep water event, the energy from that event will propagate through the water, but you don't have that same discontinuity where there's low pressure on one side and high pressure on the other, and it's that high pressure that drives things. Instead, you end up with the energy distributed through continuous waves, which uh, in their own way can be much more devastating. Yeah, I mean, they travel, sometimes tsunami waves are traveling at hundreds of kilometers an hour, and they, have, they can maintain their energy across the entire ocean sometimes. And, and these are a very, very different type of, of wave. They have different physics involved. Um, but it's important to, to think of shock waves as being a discontinuity between um, where the wave front is and the front and the backside of the, the wave front. Uh, tsunamis don't quite have that discontinuity the same way. And so now that we've taught everybody about chalk waves, imagine we went back to Russia and, and there was another one of those explosions happening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You don't want to imagine that, but um, you. Know, I guess our advice would be: if get away from the window. If you hear that explosion, you see some event in the sky, and you haven't heard it yet. Treat it like a tornado. That that's the best way to think of this: is to treat it like a tornado, where you have that large differential pressure, and that large differential pressure is driving high power winds, and it's those winds that are going to do all the damage. Yeah. And so, you know, if you see the flash and you see the explosion and you haven't heard anything yet, then there's a big noise coming and it could be very disruptive. So and, get away from and the windows. The, one, one of the questions that, that I got on Twitter that I'm just going to answer here, um, I'll follow up on Twitter in case the poor fellow isn't watching. Um, if a nuclear blast went off in the Earth's atmosphere, it would generate a different shaped shock wave simply because the the meteor, meteorite, no meteoroid at this point, was moving through the atmosphere. And as it moved through the atmosphere, it created a cylindrical shock wave off of it. Um, if you detonate a, a nuclear bomb, that's a moving shock wave that, that's in a single place and it moves outwards from that single place. The experience from a single person at a single place, um, they're going to have a similar experience as long as they're the same distance away from where the shock wave was generated. Uh, it's it's bad either way, but at least the the falling rock from space doesn't have radiation with it. It just has right. the nasty sonic boom. Right, but uh, but get away from the windows. I think that's and the and don't fly sure your planes learned. at faster than the speed of of sound over cities because right. they, they, we don't allow it because it does cause damage. Also very damaging. Okay, yeah. well thanks Pamela, I appreciate that, and we'll see you we'll see you next week. Sounds great, Fraser. Talk to you later. Now don't go anywhere. We're just saving our audio. And then we'll get to your questions. So queue up any questions if you want. Um, okay. Export. We are safe. Okay. Yay. Whew. Okay. Um, so Excelsior Views 3 asks, will Pamela or Fraser answer comment questions or are they discussing this amongst themselves? So so we will answer comments and questions now. So if you Okay, I heard com comments and I was like, uh, we comment will answer questions? Comment, we will answer comment questions as well. Yes. We have nothing against comments or comments. Nope. Well, we don't want them to hit. No, but our but in general, we have nothing against them. Yeah. Um, let's see. So Tom Nath says, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Tom. Basic lightning flash to bang distance calculation. Count the number of seconds from the flash to the boom, and then divide by five. And that gives you the, your distance. So is a is a lightning causing a shock wave? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Because it's like an explosion, you're getting, but isn't it like you're getting the, the like the air around where the strike is happening is moving really quickly in one it's direction It's moving it the faster other. than the speed of sound, yeah. But is it is it falling inward or is it going outward? 
outward because what, what's happening is the electricity moves through the atmosphere as it's ionizing. So that, that's where you get the huge light, uh, you get the molecules getting burst apart, and you get the boom. Right. Um, so M. Wildday1980 asks, can you work out the speed of a meteorite for the amount of time the boom takes? No. You can work it out based on... Um, so you can use the boom to get at where it was at a specific time if you hear the boom from multiple locations. Um, that, that's the real issue. And then the length of the boom gives you a hint of how long the object was in the atmosphere um, because you're getting the sonic boom from when it was here, when it was here, when it was here, when it was here. And all those different booms moving through make a long continuous noise. This is why lightning appears to rumble and rumble onwards. Right. Um, Matthew Jones asks, oh, this is a great question. Um, what type of shockwave would be required to hurt you if you were lying on the ground outside? So you're not getting shredded by glass. You're just, uh, you're just standing there. Oh, and hey, Scott. Scott Lewis, co-host on the uh, Virtual Star Party, has, has going, joined guys? us to, uh, to jump in and, and help answer questions and, uh, and talk about uh, South by Southwest. But Yes. So, so yeah, so what kind of shockwave would it take to actually hurt you if you're if you're away from a building and just the the wave of the it, you'd have to be very close to where the sonic boom originated uh because just hitting you with air at a high enough pressure will break bones. But I guess first thing to go would be your would be your eardrums, right? Yeah, but you can completely mash a person into a muddy pile of squish grossness if they're close enough to the point of origin of a sonic boom. Oh. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's no f I mean, it, we shared that video on, on the weekly space hangout and you could see that, you know, huge metal doors are being blown open by this sonic boom. So imagine if they were even closer to it or if it actually was, you know, if it impacted the grounds, if that's where the shockwave started, it, it could efficiently rearrange you in, in ways that you probably wouldn't be waking up the next morning. It's it's crazy on what the amount of energy is going on there and it's just moving the air against your body and there you know so it's reminding you that yes this has mass. It's matter and it can really do bad things to you if it's going fast enough. Um, Don Denesiak asks, uh, is the Russian event related to the meters in Cuba and California cited recently? No. Um, so first of all, I haven't been able to find anything confirming what happened over Cuba. So so be skeptical on that yes. one. Uh, the Russian one, we have we have multiple different sets of, of imagery, both ground-based and space-based from weather satellites. There's no similar confirmation for the one over Cuba, and Cuba is picked up by a lot of different weather satellites for American, British, and French islands. Um, the, the, there was an event over Florida and there was an event over California that were picked up, but those were fairly frequent type of events. Um, I think people are just much more sensitive to what's going on in the sky right now. I think right. that's exactly it, right? I get I get reports of bolides from people all the time. I get an email saying, I saw this really bright meteor over, you know, insert city here. And then I encourage them to go and, and send file a report with the amsmeteors.org to sort of because they're the they're the group that are actually tracking all of the bright meteors and bolides and stuff that happen. But these happen all the time. I mean, yeah, meteorite men. There, there's an entire television show dedicated to going out and and tracking down the locations that these things fall and following up on it and finding the chunk of rocks. Um, it it just happened to be that the one over Russia um, was the most violent in a hundred years. Have you ever seen a bolide before? Oh yeah, yeah, several times. Yeah, have you really, Scott? Have you seen a bolide yeah. go by? Uh, I have, and then there's the one, I believe it was like nine months ago, over by me, actually, between Vegas and California, that you were able to hear the, the, the sonic boom go off, but it wasn't anything huge, but they were able to find the meteorites themselves. But yeah, I think it was around seven or eight months ago that happened out here. But yeah, it's really, it's really awesome, actually, looking up and seeing, you know, 
we're being attacked from space. From space. But we're being attacked from space all the time because there's stuff in space. Yeah. And we collide with it. There's a great experiment you can do. If you haven't cleaned out your gutters recently, um, you can go and like clean out your gutters because you need to do it, but grab all that goop and put it in a in a bucket and then swish the bucket around and let it you know, get put a lot of water into it so that it can then to return to this muck and then uh, put a magnet into it and you'll be able to pull out little chunks of meteorites uh, from your roof. And this is just this debris that's constantly raining down. And that's just the, the metallic stuff. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great experiment to do to show people that, in fact, the universe is trying to, well, trying to kill us. But in, I had you know, in this no case, idea. You ever done that? You ever heard about that experiment? Yeah, it's no, pretty cool. No, no. I have to wonder, though, because so, so just to be slightly disgusting, yesterday I watched as three sparrows came, landed on the edge of our gutter. It's like, oh, how cute. And then they all pooed straight into the gutter. Yeah, unless and, they're pooing metallic poo, though. Well, so, so I'm wondering, though, they, they have to have iron in their diet the same way we do, otherwise the red blood doesn't work. You is... get little nuggets okay, okay. of metal off your okay. roof. Yeah, yeah. So, but you have to you have to have not cleaned your gutter in a while. So, go out and you know ask a neighbor who clearly hasn't been cleaning their gutters to to help you uh, if you can help them out. But yeah, I know. I think this was this was actually I think I saw it with, from a NASA experiment that you can do. Like they have a whole bunch of science experiments you can do. And this was it was on the internet somewhere. It, it was on the internet somewhere, and so it has to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and Tom Nate says, and you're breathing the dust as well. So yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean. A bolide, you know, if you're out watching for meteors a lot, you know, you might see a bolide every couple of years. And and, and the um, Leonids, uh, the meteor shower, um, that so basically the August, November, and December meteor showers, the Leonids, mm -hmm. the Geminids, and Perseids. Perseids, is that the yeah, thing? yeah, uh, those three. Uh, when when we pass directly through the larger, fresher trails, uh, fairly frequently have bullets. Um, it, it was the November meteor shower back in '98, I believe. I could be one plus or minus one year on that. I we were packing up because the sun was most of the way up, and we were going to go to IHOP, having spent the whole night basically watching for shooting stars and uh, while we were packing up there was a bullet that was so bright that it cast shadows off of the domes of the telescopes that was kind of Whoa. awesome oh and people were out there watching for it yeah you get those yeah. situations where they they leave this trail in the sky and you hear this crackling if you're lucky mm -hmm. and you get this flash and then there's no question where it happened because the trail will last for seconds and sometimes even like a minute up in the sky. And, that and that's amazing. the ionized material that, that is in the process of deionizing and it just takes time for all the atoms to uh, reclaim and drop their electrons to the proper energy levels. Yeah. Calm down electrons. <laughs> Simmer down. <laughs> um, uh, Excelsior Views 3 asks, will we be able to detect in future small meteorites that fall regularly like the one that happened in Russia? Now, I wouldn't say regularly is the way to describe that thing. That was a once-in-a-hundred-year yeah. event. And, and it was also rather troubling because um, since it was coming out of the east, traveling towards the west, it was essentially coming out of where the sunlight was. So we couldn't easily have detected that one within a few days of when it occurred simply because its path was too close to the sun in the sky. Yeah, uh, but but it, I mean, for its size, it was about 50 feet across. It was about 7,000 tons. That is detectable. I mean, I think originally we thought it was a lot smaller. Well, and, and, but it'd be like looking at a mode of dust when someone's shining a flashlight in your face, it's you're not gonna be able. To, you know, you have all that light coming from the sun and something that tiny. No, if it wasn't doing that trajectory, is all yeah. I'm saying. Like if it was in orbit and we were watching it and it was slowly moving closer and closer and then kaboom, right? And so, so we have detected objects of similar size, but only a couple of days before they got close to the Earth, and and it's the issue of when they're that small, they can only reflect so much sunlight back to Earth, and rocks are fairly dark. Um, so they're just too faint to generally get observed. Uh, Rodolf Dinka asked, um, what is the plume visible on the pictures and videos made of? So you know that, that plume that's across the sky in the, in the pictures, in the video? What is that? 
I am not entirely sure because that's not rock. my no. It's not exploded rock. It's not no. It it's definitely an interaction of the extremely um, heat giving off, for lack of a better term, um, rock going through the atmosphere and thermally and chemically interacting with the material around it. Matter. It's matter. Um, okay, so here, oh, this is good. So Violin Girl seventy nine asks, if you were in space and screamed, you'd be expelling molecules. Would they vibrate? And if one of those molecules hit your ear, would it make a very tiny sound? If this, if it's coming out of your mouth, it's propagating away from your ear. So your own scream, you probably couldn't hear. No, but, but if, if it hit somebody friend, else. If your friend got up next to you and screamed into your ear, expelling the last breath in their lungs before they <laughs> yeah. die, yes, that's something they might it. be doing. That's not true. Right. Yes. If they're in I'm space, I'm dying. Space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you might actually hear that. Yeah. As you're not wearing a spacesuit either. No, you're both in the process of dying, and this is assuming that your eardrum has not yet flash, flash frozen. Um. Richard Haywood asks, uh, Pamela, what are the cool microphones that you use? <laughs> yeah, you, I have different mics depending on where I am in the house. I think all the mics that Fraser and I are using right now are from Blue Audio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a, a Blue Yeti. And that's about a $120 microphone, I think. I'm yeah, not I sure. Right. I have a yeah. husband who buys some microphones. Right. And then I use... A blue snowball. And uh, no reason why I have a blue snowball instead of a blue Yeti, except I'm cheaper, and mine is about $60. But also, one of the cool things about the blue snowball is it's a lot better for picking up sounds in a room. So I wanted something that I could, if I want to do interviews or have like a group setting, be able to set this microphone down in the middle of a table, and it picks up both on the, on the back and on the front, and you can change the settings. So... And I have a new microphone that I'm using downstairs, which I'm looking up what it is real fast. Um, but I, I, I mean, I absolutely recommend the the blue snowball, the blue the blue microphones. And the main reason yeah. is because they go into your USB. They've got a built-in. Um, Not all of them, but they have a they have what's called the icicle, uh, yeah. which will uh, it, it's a preamp. Yeah, it'll connect any any you know XLR microphone into your computer. But but the olden days, the way we used to do it, and I've still got my we used our M Audio. Yeah, so we would use a we would use a preamp and then go with an XLR connection into the preamp, and then the preamp would go into the computer, and it was just misery. It was and, always a pain. Okay, yours was always a pain. Mine always worked perfectly. Um, so, so that's what I still have when I'm on campus. But is, he doesn't is, have a husband that buys him microphones. Well, no, no, no. Yeah. M Audio is 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 one that that I did get for myself on campus. Um, <laughs> so, so M Audio uh, is what I use on campus. At home, I have a Yeti in in this part of my house, yeah. and then in my downstairs studio, which has better quality audio, um, but tends to have more dogs. So. Right. Yeah, juggle. Um, I have a Bluebird, which I got because I'm starting to do more and more professional audio recording. Yeah, but in general, you you really can't go wrong with any of these mics, and and more importantly, it's so much simpler to just plug it into your computer and get good, solid output that you can depend on. Like it just yeah. removes a whole level of audio fiddling that that was just driving both of us crazy for years and years. So I think, you know, highly recommend to go this route to anybody who wants to get into podcasting. And the sound yeah. is fantastic. So it's not, you know, really high end, but it's good enough. The, the key is you want to get something that has a condenser mic built into it if you want nice, warm, rich sounds. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's why these things are actually quite heavy. They've got a built-in condenser microphone inside of them. Um, let's see. Oh, a whole bunch of questions. Yikes. Uh, okay, so... Uh, Christopher Long says, I did a version of Fraser's gutter experiment back in high school. I used buckets to correct rainwater and used coffee filters to filter it and found several small metal fragments too. So that's wow. another way to do it. Yeah, so so collect a bucket of water and then run filters to get at the uh, meteorites inside of it. 
It's always did raining I, space stuff out there. Did I, did I just blow your minds? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's a yes. great experiment. Yeah. But, it's, but what's great is if you pull it from the roof, then you get the bigger chunks because it, they've been collecting up there for decades. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I run a condo. I don't have to do any of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. So someone suggested that that we should gather up all of those pennies in the United States and then use that for funding NASA. And I just want to note that here in Canada, we no longer have pennies. It's true. As of yeah, as of about a week ago, they've uh, they've stopped using pennies. And and I'm not sure that we have enough pennies in all of the circulation in the United States to make a noticeable dent on the uh, space yeah. budget. Um, so Roger, okay, so Roger Ebert retweeted or tweeted a the link. Roger Ebert, the yeah, Roger say, Ebert, really? not 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 he's not not in this. He tweeted an article saying that in 2080 the orbit of 2012 AD 14 actually should be DA 14 will slam into the Earth at almost 18,000 miles per hour. Uh, no, I, I don't think that's true. Is that a movie no. review? That sounds like a movie review. <laughs> I know. So no, I you know no. from what I understand, is Bruce Willis involved? Yeah, 2012 <laughs> DA 14. Is is not predicted to hit the Earth in any way, shape, or form for as far out as astronomers are able to calculate the orbit. So, yeah. All right, we'll get a couple of more questions and then. Uh, um, so, Matthias Anderson asks: Are there any known events like the one in Russia back in history, excluding the Tunguska event, that we have scientific data on? There is some evidence um, that gets debated for a meteorite event that was probably somewhat bigger than Tunguska that occurred over, I believe, Saudi Arabia at the end of the Bronze Age. Hmm. Um, and then, of course, we have the, uh, well, the Bronze Age is quite recent because we always have the, uh, the meteor crater in Arizona, but that was about 50,000 years ago, right? And, and then the whole formation of the Yucatan Peninsula and death of the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, then they get there's some bigger ones that, <clears throat> that did leave a, an impact. In the land before um, time, when Littlefoot died, that's, yeah. Oh, here's a question. So Eli Acosta asks, is there a scent to the meteor vapor trail? Uh, that depends on what material decided to get vaporized. So, yes, there could be if you, like, for instance, decide to send a meteorite through the atmosphere of Titan. That might be stinky. But, but I was wondering, like, would there have been a smell in Russia after this meteorite explosion? I wonder if anybody noted that or reported I, on well, it. Well, you wouldn't have been able to smell it as low down as the, the surface of the planet. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's just a matter of... It, it occurred so high up and winds and dissipation and everything else. Yeah, I mean, it's that was 32,000 feet. Yeah, I mean, that's like up in the jet stream, right? So that would just blow it sideways at 100 kilometers an hour. So, yeah. I mean, the Felix Baumgartner happened to go through at that <laughs> yeah. time. Take off his helmet, <laughs> scream, <Right. laughs> smell, and scream. I'm dying. <laughs> and then. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, we're going to give one last question here. And this comes from Jonathan Langdale. Um, could the flight from the flash have given information on the makeup of the meteoroid, like with a spectrograph, assuming yeah. there's a way to have captured it? Yeah, it the, it would the the moral equivalent of setting something on fire and seeing what gets ionized in the process. Um, I just don't think anyone had a spectrograph pointed uh, at. But could you point a spectrograph yes. at the at the light changing in some of those videos and stuff? No, yeah. no, because the right information isn't recorded. It has to be done in real time. Hmm. I wonder if somewhere See, there's now something... Now we need more spectrographs pointed <laughs> yeah. up No, all we're the not time. doing all-sky spectroscopy. Come on. Why not? That sounds great. No. Um, okay. This sounds complicated. That's why, right? Because it's complicated Because you get to go through it, Fraser. Yeah. Once it's done, you get to go through all that data. I'll go through all that data. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Match those spectral lines up perfectly. <laughs> uh, so what's the next thing that we're doing this week? Wednesday? Um, I don't know. I haven't looked at my calendar enough. Yes. Don't uh, we usually do a thing on Wednesday? Isn't there like some Yeah, kind of but there's education? sometimes something on Tuesday. So, I don't think he got on Tuesday. I think it's just... Oh, uh, Detlef Crows is saying that people reported a gunpowder-like smell in the city, according to Wikipedia. 
which of course So that could have altered. been something happening at the surface of the planet because if you think about it, there was a zinc factory that got set on fire. Right, and windows smashing probably smell. Yeah, so it looks like the next thing is this Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 7 p oh, sorry, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern is Learning Space hosted by Nicole Gallucci and Georgia Bracey. And this week, they are going to be talking with Connie Walker and other members of the Dark Sky team about Globe at Night. Awesome. And then we've got uh, Friday, we're going to do the Weekly Space Hangout, where we talk about uh, all of the big breaking space news. We'll probably still be talking about the meteor next uh, <laughs> next Friday, or giving some and, updates on and it. And Thursday is the Planetary Society Hangout. Yes. And oh, so great. we're trying to bring you something as many days of the week as we can. And then also, and this is very special, is on Friday at 7 a.m. Pacific, uh, there's going to be the first live hangout with the International Space Station. Right. So that's going to be on. So if you do a search for it on Google+, Plus, you can probably find the event. And then if you click yes on the event, it, it'll translate it into your time and put it in your calendar. But that's going to be great, I think, to see you know the astronauts are going to be answering questions live from, from folks in a hangout, which is kudos to NASA for, for yeah. organizing that. Uh, and and I, Commander Hatfield's been great as far I, as all of his tweets. And I think his son's running his Google Plus account for yeah. him when he's not doing it. I mean, it's yeah. just been great and really engaging with everybody. Yeah, and I submitted a question, so we'll see if it gets... Uh, if it gets asked to nice. so, yeah. And then uh, Sunday night, we do our virtual star party. So uh, we're going to be busy, busy. Yes, and then South by Southwest, and gosh, two Three and a half weeks. weeks? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be great. It'll be great to finally meet you, Scott. I know. It'll be great. <laughs> yeah, so that's great. Um, Lots of things are planned. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, thanks, guys, for joining us. Thanks for everybody watching. Thanks for posting those wonderful questions. That was great. Uh, this will show up in the uh, audio feed as soon as we can, and we'll see everyone at the next thing, whatever that is. Okay. All right. <laughs> see you guys later.